Hello, welcome everyone to another episode of Dark Souls 3 Lore Through. Um, my controller turned off. Alright. So, <coughs> in the last episode, sorry, I'm still sick. In the last episode, we, uh, explored this kind of catacombs area um, and got kicked by lap or patches or whatever um, and learned about the greed of humanity now we have to fight the deer This is kind of annoying. I might die a few times here. I don't know. We'll see. Oh, he's done with his AI. Relatively simple AI to get here. Okay, that means that he's about to be stunned. Oh, that's too bad. It's time to get up to the first area. Yeah. Now the only thing is that last freak out, I don't know where to go. I'm not even sure if everything I do here is, like, the best way to do it. Can you hit his head? I'll just stick to the way that I normally do it. I'm just trying to be safe. It's a scripted event, so that you can knock him down. Now that doesn't defeat him. We don't get any souls. And I'm just gonna sharpen that real quick. Um
but uh, now that allows us to actually fight him in the boss fight. The f boss fight. Okay, that's where we just were. These uh, silver knight statues. And we hear something suspicious. Wait. There. I see. Now, what's really suspicious is that there's another one inside with the large soul of a weary warrior. And what's even weirder is that there's another one with a cool spell called Lightning Arrow. A few female knights who served in the Age of the Gods use this miracle for dragon slaying. Draw a lightning from bow to fire a lightning arrow. The lightning arrows offer a great improvement to the range of spears and were said to have been used to pierce the eyes of dragons from afar. But remember, beautiful stories are always marked by embellishment. I don't need any Titanite scales, so. Well, now we see an awesome image. We see the pygmies. Looks like the pygmy from the first cutscene. And Gwyn, his helmet, giving a similar helmet, not his uh, crown, giving a similar helmet to the pygmy plus an item in his right hand. What would he be giving to the pygmies along with like kingdom? Well now we're here back at the inner wall where we first Locked in on the Ring City. And this time, we can get through the store now and we can fall on top of this. Chloranthi Ring plus three. The soldering is named for its decade of green blossom, but its luster is long since faded. Raises stamina, stamina recovery speed. So that has some sort of significance with pygmies. Or humanity, or whatever. And so, I mean, those have been there since the beginning, I guess. I don't know. Stamina. Stamina. Humanity. So yeah, there's a hidden wall here. Filinor's spear ornament. Oops. The spears of the church watch over the princess's slumber. We heard about them from this. Guardians of the church, of whom few remain, watch over Princess Filinor's eternal slumber along with the spears of the church. Spears of the church watch over the princess's slumber, and this serves as proof of their fulfillment of their duty. Ah, so it's a covenant. The embellished gold cloth is woven with a crest of young grass. Maybe like the chloranthi, like the green blossom. And Princess's Knight proudly displayed these precious favors, which were most often seen swaying from their identical ceremonial spears. Antiquated plain garb. 
ordinary garb from an ancient land of sorcery. The gold embellishments be betray a faint residue of magic, but this clothing was never intended for battle. When a mission visited the Ring City long ago, one of its younger missionaries elected to stay behind. It was he who became the last recorded spear of the church. These arm wrappings sewn with violet cloth and embroidered with gold thread were intended for everyday use, yet they served well enough in many a battle in wreathing the arms of one who would go on to embrace the sword. So it seems like <coughs> um, um, there was someone from Ulusil that came here on mission, well a group, um, but one stayed behind. That makes sense. We've been finding a lot of Ula Seal based stuff here. The birch bow and um, stuff like that. Um, the, the dusk stuff and whatever. And it turns out that they became the uh, last spear of the church, and we actually will meet him. So, yeah. We can summon Shira for this fight. However, I'm going to just do this alone. Um, this is a tough battle, so uh, I don't care about my souls. I don't care about anything. I'm just going to try to do this. It would be nice if I could do it in one try. But <coughs> most likely, um, I might just cut here to the... Um, to the, uh, the attempt where I actually beat him. Um, the only other thing to note while I fall down this really large hole here is that in the first game, in the cutscene, they said light appeared and then there became disparity. Light and dark, you know, hot and cold, pain and pleasure, whatever. That's n None of those were the, what they said, but you know what I mean. And they go down into where the pygmies came out of the ground or whatever and so where we fight Madeir is that place where we zoom down this big shaft and then looked upon this ground with the first flame behind it and the pygmies rising out of it that's where we'll fight so I'll just draw your attention to that in case I get cut off from doing multiple takes of this He has those uh, dark crystals on his leg. Which is interesting. Also, his head takes uh, double damage. But oftentimes, you can only hit his head like once. So, I mean, it isn't. going on here. So it's nice to hit his head, but I mean, like, it doesn't, like, solve the issue of getting more damage on him all the time, because a lot of times... good for hitting his head though.
what's happening. Battle is somewhat uh, RNG based, I guess. Like he can do his terrible attacks. I mean, it's just it's such a battle of attrition that like you're most likely gonna see most of his attacks. So it's not too RNG. Like you have to get them really. Thought I could get that in there. Yeah, I mean, I'll take the, like, I'll take taking a couple of hits at his head, like, over the RNG, because sometimes it mostly works out. Oops. Okay, let's 
Et hop. Seems like there's probably a good chance that he does that twice. And that's what they call one shot Madeir. So we get the Spears of the Church Covenant item, and we get the Soul of Madeir. So, yeah, now that we have can look around, this is where the first flame happened in the back, and then all these are probably the pygmies and stuff that came to the whatever. I think it's cool that they set it here. It's a nice arena. It's nice and huge. Great fight. <laughs> I like it a lot more than the Calamite fight. As you may or may not have noticed because I skipped Calamite and I did this. But anyway, let's uh, let's look at this. Medir, descendant of arch dragons, was raised by the gods and owing to his immortality was given a duty to eternally battle the dark. Those crystals on his tail probably were his, somewhat of his immortality. A duty that he would never forget, even after the gods perished. Although, uh, Shira thought he might, so. A green, rusted ornament of young grass. Again, Chloranthi ring. The crest of Princess Filianor. The spears of the church watch, and maybe that's just that way because Gwyn gave the Chloranthi ring to them or something. I don't know. The spears of the church watch over the princes of slumber, and when the church is promised, or compromised uh, by a trespasser, the adjudicator summons them as loyal spirits to eliminate the threat. Loyal spirits summoned as spears of the church are granted a blessing protection. So... Let's go to the inner wall, right? Yes. <coughs> and talk to Shira. And see what she has to say about what's gone on. They make this more or less easy, but it does suck that we have to kill that Herald Knight in order to talk to Shira. The rest of this is just a formality, you know. Oh wow. Um I think we already like read this essentially, but I love this armor. The armor sank into the dark with the Legion where the cavities bloated in grotesque displays, never again to fit any ordinarily shaped body. My most humble thanks. Tis thanks to thee the dragon erred not from his vows. Please take this. A final gift of thanks. Now, hasten on thy journey, but wake not the slumbering princess, as the fire waneth as she lie by the dark. You said that. My humblest not as But
We shall wake her. <coughs> okay, so... Yeah, let's take care of this guy here. It's like the guy we fought at the beginning. Stagger. Oops. And you get the ring knight. Paired great swords, which is obviously people love to troll with these on multiplayer. Paired black great swords wielded by the ring knights. The arms of early men were forged in the abyss and betray a smidgen of life. For this reason, the gods, yeah, same description. And we also got a, oops. Uh, a, a fragment. A fragment of the matching ritual spears once held by the knights of Princess Filionor. They are the namesake of the spears of the church. When spears of the church face unduly treacherous foes, this allows them to draw on upon former majesty and summon a row of upward thrusting ritual spears. Can't use it. <coughs> and then this is where you can offer the ornaments for your covenant. Of course, we got the green blossoms everywhere, makes sense. I don't know that that's how you're supposed to get there. I think you're supposed to drop off from here, but what it is. Um, okay. I think that's it. These obviously were Ring Knight statues. So, um, oops, <laughs> I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, that was the Judicator Giant. He's got a specific name. Here we go. These are the people directly protecting Philanor. So we shall go. Now this is a multiplayer fight. Uh, I am offline for the purpose of just getting rid of the invaders that were around. Uh, although I got rid of all invaders and this fight. And <coughs> also this fight is lore based if you do it the other way. But traditionally if you go in here it will summon a like a person who's usually maximized their uh, equipment for this and and it's kind of hard I mean they they are limited you know you you definitely can like summon a, a bunch of people and stuff um, patches and they're only the one and they can't heal and and they have whatever but I don't know they tend to be pretty overpowered um, but that's not the main issue I want to see the guy from Ulusil. Um, and how he fights and his weapons and stuff like that. But um, 
Hopefully this will go without much of a problem. I don't think we're a spear. So you can try to kill him, but I mean, he just disappears and whatever. So that, yeah, so here are the painting guardians that guard Philanar. Okay, they're not too bad alone. But then they bring in this guy, Half Light, who can uh, parry me, by the way. So I like to parry him when I can. He uses the uh, bow. Okay, now he has his thing out. So I don't want to. I like the roll catching ability of of the butchers, whatever you call it. Ooh. I don't know why I didn't attempt to avoid that. Okay, so he's got the bow. Oh, he's oh, back. Alright, so that's that. Half Light of Ulusil. Do you give us anything in particular? Like, is this just the, the regular. Yeah. But yet another Titanite Slap. So here's where we have to look at some geography, so to speak. Like, Like, am I just missing this? Is this the, like... Is this the thing that's on top of that hill? Or is it just behind here and I can't see it? Because that's certainly the area where we came down. Yeah, I guess it's behind this, so I just... Okay. That's interesting. But yeah, you can see more of these uh, things that we kind of jutted into... Uh, um, Henri, close up, as the 
I guess, a crest of the Ring City. <coughs> now here's where I'm going to go into a little bit of a, uh, uh, a lore thing here. I don't have a way to connect it, um, like some YouTube, well, I mean, I do have a way, but I'm not going to do it. Um, maybe I'll do like a, you know, a separate series or something later where I grab all the stuff I, you know, um, uh, all the images and all the times that I played them here and, and compile them into a lore video, but... Um, so the thing is, is that this egg right here, this is Filionor, by the way, who is definitely alive, and who has silver hair, again, maybe white hair and black hair, maybe Velka, the purging monument is here, but no other element of Velka is here. Um... <clears throat> but this image of the egg with the circle and the stuff in there, when they released the um, promotional stuff for the Ring City, they showed this and that the inside of that looked like a transposing kiln uh, that you got f uh, from the, the tree in the Undead Settlement and gave to Ludlith. And it doesn't look like that on pawn release, unfortunately, but it kind of uh, does evoke it. Again, I don't even have the transposing kiln, so we can't even, I mean, unless they let you keep it for some reason. So we can't compare it. And it said it was made out of crystal lizards. But, um, Ludlith is a pygmy. Um... We're going to see something. I'm probably going to cut it off here and do everything else, finish everything off in the last episode. But um, Ludlith is a pygmy. There's no denying it. He's short. Uh, he has the same proportions as another being that we'll see here. In fact, he could be a pygmy lord, uh, a pygmy king of the Ring City. And Corland. <coughs> We haven't really talked about this a lot, but Miyazaki definitely loves to play with the names uh, of things, uh, and you know, Gwyn means white in you know Welsh, Welsh or whatever. Anastasia means uh, rebirth or whatever. Um, you know, Solaire, like soul air, the air of the sun, Solaire. Um, like, there are so many attempts at using names to communicate ideas in this game, and it doesn't s stop at Dark Souls 1. It continues with um, Dark Souls 2 and 3. And to me, Corlin, so Cor is French for, like, circle, uh, or like, uh, like court, like a court, like a courtyard or something like that. That's where, that's the English word we have for it. So to me, Ludlith probably uh, originates from the Ring City, because he's from Core Land, like the Ring Land, the Circle Land. And his the transposing kiln was native to his land and was what made um, his community like um, like heretics. You know what I mean? And we know that the Pygmy City was, like, kept away from everything else uh, via Gwyn, maybe? Um, and, uh, and so, to me, I think that, although this isn't a big, this doesn't, like, change a bunch of, like, theories or fill in a lot of gaps, it is certainly, it is simply a connection between the base game in this game and and it's even more intriguing based on the fact that we hypothesized that you know Ludlith was the most recent Lord of Cinder and that there is something that has gone on here uh, in this world 
Uh, and we, we will see the uh, Lords of the Pygmies. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it makes sense that, you know, we'll, we'll examine the area when we get there, so I won't go into too much detail there, but I just believe that uh, Ludlith is, has come from Corland. He's very, very old. He's one of the original Pygmies, um, and that he, um, learned the transposing kiln arts from this world which comes from this which was a transposing kiln which is something that controls the illusion of this place as we will see right now So, um, a lot of people have different opinions about what's gone on here. Um, some people say that this was all an illusion and that when you broke that, um, it broke the illusion, much like killing Rom, like, revealed the, or removed the illusions of, like, the amygdala and stuff in Bloodborne. But, um... Some people think that this caused you to travel forward in time, as evidenced by the fact that she is now, like, a corpse here. I'm sure it has something to do with jumping ahead in time over an illusion, because illusions usually, you know, especially the way that they've been done in From Games, have a lot more to do with the fact that they are illusion and that they, like, like... If I could walk around in an area, it was actually there. And the illusion isn't the fact that I can go anywhere and do anything. Um, <coughs> and this is from the cutscene that we saw in the beginning. Um, this is where the uh, pilgrims were, were crawling through the dust. And uh, we saw all the, the, tra the, thing, the transitory lands coming together and um, so we can see here we can see Lothric in fact that's where we fight the Dragon Slayer armor right there or you know what that's actually where we run up it looks like Boletaria and the Demon Prince is up there and then when we fight those three winged knights that protected Gertrude was right there so I guess the Dragon Slayer armor is down below and then over here we can see Drang Lake I'm sure some people think that this looks like, uh, you know, Anor Londo or whatever. But if you if you just look at the image of Drang Lake in the opening shot of um, of Dark Souls Two, you will see that uh, this is that. So I don't know if there is um, an image of Anor Londo anywhere, but um, 
it is kind of cool to see like all of the other games referenced in that in that uh, thing. So um, I'm gonna call it uh, an episode here, and I'm gonna run back online, and then I'm going to do all the invasions uh, from the DLC, and then we will uh, do the final boss here, and I'm gonna probably summon someone for him. And then I will do the final boss of the game, and we will do the conclusion of the whole game, and we will call it a Dark Souls 3. So thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!